I'm Meredith Taylor. Welcome to HorseCity.com TV, your connection to the horse world. Alan is off today. He's out announcing a rodeo. But coming up on today's show, we're putting you in the saddle with Craig Cameron, who's always got some good advice for us. We're at the barn. Alan got to hang out with Dana Boyd Miller down in Florida, and they're talking about clipper maintenance. Then we're at the clinic with Dr. Bill, who will show you some more ways to tell if your horse needs a chiropractor. And we'll wrap up our show when Karen Scholl puts you in the irons and discusses motivation through the bubble of comfort. All this and more today on HorseCity.com TV. In the saddle. You know, there's an old time saying, sacking your horse out. And you know, really that saying came from because they used a lot of feed sacks and stuff to sack these horses out. What is sacking the horse? It's a way of ta it's taking the fear out of your horse. It's trying to get him where he's not boogery against foreign and strange objects. So a lot of times they just use an old feed sack. So look, I got an old plastic bag right here on the end of a short stick right here. And look, I'd start just by checking it out. I wouldn't just come up and start waving it at my horse and wonder why he got scared. Remember, the whole idea is to show him that he doesn't have to be afraid. Remember, that's not natural to the horse. The natural thing for a horse is to always run away from the things that scare him. And we're always asking him to stay put. You know, it's a matter of trust. Remember, trust is simply a belief. So I don't want to do anything to destroy the belief that this horse might have in me. In other words, that I wouldn't hurt him or get him hurt. So look, if I'm going to start with a sack like this, what I'd like to do is just wad it up like this. Just wad it up. And look here. That way this horse can kind of see it and hear it and feel it. And I just start easy like this. Just start easy and rub this horse like this. And when I think he's getting better, I'll just take it away and check him out. See, by having it on this stick, boy, I, I, I avoid a lot of the danger, a lot of the risk that might be involved. This horse felt like he needed to kick. you got to remember, if this horse kicks, it's not that he's doing anything wrong. He's only doing what he thinks he's supposed to do. In other words, it's your job to give him the reason to change. So I check him, 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 just like this, here, here. Remember, that's a blind spot and could really be spooky for a lot of horses. Remember, anything you do on one side, you be sure and do it on the other. So if I bring this horse this way here, I get ready, and I work the right eye of this horse, just like this. So I check him here, and here, and here, and here, and here. Here's where you'll be sitting right here. You can see that makes that horse a little nervous. And you know what? If he needs to move, that's okay. Shoot, I don't blame him. Let him move. And I'm just showing him, hey, it's okay. It's okay. Not going to harm you. You know, and once I get a horse good like this, I can just go to a bigger tarp or something like that and literally sack this old pony out. But look, I got it. Look how small. I got it wadded up little. And I start easy like this. I just start easy, easy. And make sure this horse is not going to be afraid of this thing. So I'm going to push him over here. Let him see it. Let him hear it. Uh, let him feel it. And as he gets a little better, then I just open this thing up. Listen, never tie this tarp to that saddle unless you're looking for the biggest wreck of your life. See, I got it. If it spooks him, all I got to do is take it away. So more here, here. Pretty soon, I can just get to where I can feed that thing out. Careful that it doesn't hang on that saddle horn. Just get to where I can fold this thing out here, here, all the way through. I got it here. And pretty soon, this old pony, he just get more and more sure all the time. Sure. That's your job, to make your horse feel safe, sure, certain, and secure, just like you like to feel. So sacking out, if you do it right, is such a great thing for your horse. It takes the fear out of these horses. You know, I always say I want to make a brave horse. The bravery comes from me. Remember, confidence and trust is something that is gained. <laughs> Up next on HorseCity.com TV, we're at the barn making sure your clippers work like you need them to. Then we're at the clinic with Dr. Bill who shows you ways to tell if your horse needs a chiropractor. And we'll wrap up our show in the irons with Karen Scholl's Horsemanship for Women. We're at the barn looking into proper clipper maintenance. 
We're here with Dana Boyd Miller, and we're talking care and maintenance of our clippers. Dana, what's the first thing that we should really do to make our clippers last longer? Well, oiling frequently is going to prolong the life of your blade and keep the blade cool. Also, it'll help the horse stand quietly. I like to oil probably every 15 to 20 minutes, and I'll use a timer. I'll set an egg timer for 15 to 20 minutes. Another way I'll remember to oil is I'll break my horse into sections. Like I'll do his head and, excuse me, I'll do his neck and shoulder, and then I'll oil. I'll clip his barrel, then I'll oil. I'll also clip his hind hip and back leg, and then I'll oil. By oiling frequently, you're doing a few things. You're going to, like we said, keep the blade cool and prolong the life of it by keeping the edge on it. But you're also going to do something for yourself, and that's called standing up and stretching. If you stay bent over all day long in that one position, you'll be so sore at the end of the day. So by oiling frequently, you're taking care of actually all three of you, your horse, your machine, and yourself. And keeping that edge on that blade is important because we're talking about how sharp it is. Now, why sometimes do I get three distinct lines and hear some funny noises in my clippers? Well, on our machine, it's, we have a patented technology, and it's called our blade drive right here. This is the piece that's made to wear out. When you see those three distinct lines and you hear it kind of barking, that's an indication that the blade drive has worn out. When you see hair being lift on the body, that's different. Like if you've clipped over it and you see some stray hair sticking up, that's actually a sign that your blade needs to be replaced. Now, is it okay to still use a clipper in my blade if I'm missing some teeth on the blade? That's an excellent question. No, if you're missing teeth on your blades, like right here and on this 40 blade, particularly on the 40 blades, when you're missing teeth, you take a really good chance of grabbing the skin on the horse versus clipping the hair. And when you're clipping with a close blade like that, it's really important that you're clipping only hair. When you nick the skin, it starts to make the animal suspicious. One of the ways, the proper way, I'm sorry? I said I would say. Oh yeah, let's go ahead and nick them instead of clip hair. <laughs> when you want to oil, the way I like to do it is I will take the blade off of my machine, I'll also remove the cap, and I'll sweep the extra hair, because as you have hair that builds up, I'll sweep the hair off, sweep it off the blade. And the reason I do this is the hair will soak up the oil. The only thing that we oil on our machine is the blade, so by taking off the extra hair, that makes it so that you're oiling only the blade and the oil isn't sucking up into the motor. We also have a little saying that says turn the machine on to put the blade on. And that's because this piece right here has to fit into the socket on the blade. So with it moving, it's easier for that blade to sit down on the socket. So it kind of basically lines up your drive shaft with the sprocket to get it going. Exactly. When you oil, you want to run a line of oil across the teeth, a little on each wing, and a place right here, it's called the back rail, you want to oil there. Basically any place where metal's touching metal. And I'll put a drop just here and here. I'll turn them on and let them run, just to kind of move the oil around, and then shut them off, wipe your extra oil off. I'll do that wipe off procedure a couple of times. As the top blade goes back and forth, it'll push oil to the side. Now the cool care, anything that says cool, typically your cooling agent is alcohol. Alcohol breaks down oil. So if it's our product or anybody else's, when you see cool involved, remember that there's not enough lubricant in that pr product to be specifically a lubricating oil. What it is, is it's a disinfectant. It's excellent for cleaning and sterilizing. When I work on horses, and this is what I'm talking about right here is cool care. Um, down here in Florida, we have a big problem with fungus. So what I found is by using my cool care after I've clipped over a fungus area, I'm not spreading the fungus through the same horse, and also I'll use it when I go from one horse to the next. It's kind of like barbicide where you're disinfecting your blades so that you're not transmitting anything. So we're keeping our horses healthy while keeping our clippers in good shape. One more thing I'd like to ask you, because we've talked about the edge on the blades already. Yes. How often should we sharpen them and how would you sharpen them? I would recommend if you're going to have your blades sharpened, and I do have mine resharpened. I have some that have been sharpened as many as 10 times. Um, you want to send them to an authorized person. Some people want to try to do their own sharpening, and that's okay, but what will happen is the blade will become wavy, and it won't clip correctly. So make sure to send your blades to somebody who has gone to school to learn how to sharpen. So again, our clippers are investments. Take care of them and make your investment last just that much longer. Thank you, Dana Boyd Miller. Thank you very much. You can find a lot of these tips at Andis' website as well. And if your computer isn't getting there quite as fast as you would like it to, HorseCity.com is giving away a free laptop every month. Just log on to HorseCity.com, click on the new 2007 contest in the upper right-hand corner. In the meantime, we're at the clinic with Dr. Bill, the chiropractor. 
and we'll wrap up our show in the irons with Karen Scholl on the Bubble of Comfort. We're at the clinic with Dr. Bill on whether or not your horse needs a chiropractor. I'm Dr. Bill Ormston. I'm a veterinarian from Salina, Texas. Uh, my practice is limited to animal chiropractic, uh, predominantly equine uh, anim uh, chiropractic. And uh, today we're here with Trouble. Uh, Trouble won a go around at the NBHA uh, President's Cup last weekend, and he was the second high money earner uh, for the whole weekend. And but we're going to look at him today, and we find out that Trouble has a few problems. Um, a few minor problems and I'm going to show you how to find all three of these minor problems and then we'll show you uh, after he adjusts and hopefully next weekend when he goes and runs he won't be the second high money earner maybe we can make him into the top so we're going to do our neck stretches we're going to come over here to the left and we can see that he can come all the way and eat off of this left shoulder he just stays there and eats notice how I can see this other eye it's looking me in the eye there's no head twist so then when we come over here to the right and we'll turn him so the camera can see it just a little better. Turn him here to the right. He follows the treat. He follows the treat. But he just won't come that last three or four inches. Okay? So that tells me he got a problem here in his lower neck. Then when we turn him sideways, we're going to do what I call some bounce. And at one, one, once you all to watch right here, okay? And when I put energy into the top of his spine up here, the belly down here should bounce. So when I do it here, you can see him bouncing, okay? When I come back here and do it, he bounces. When I come right here, there's no bounce. That means this part of his spine isn't moving correctly. What's that correlate to? If we pretend that this is the spine of the horse, this rope is the spine of the horse, Jody's the head of the horse, I'm the back of the horse, <clears throat> when I create energy, that energy travels fluently to the front of the horse. So the energy is generated in the back of the horse, transmitted to the front of the horse. When part of his spine doesn't move, that transmission goes out. Okay? Just like when the transmission in your car goes out, that energy can no longer flow. So we're getting some of that in this horse. Even though he's running well, we're just not getting the transmission that we should. Then let's go ahead and have him walk away from us again. Notice how the right side of his hip pelvis comes up higher than the left side does when he walks away from us. Bring him back and let's do it one more time. We'll go ahead and walk him away again, straight away from the camera. Watch how his, how, his, how his pelvis moves. That right side comes up higher than the left side does. And the right side doesn't really drop below, below neutral either. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and adjust him, and then we'll see if we can fix those things uh, when we look at him after our adjustment. So we went ahead and we adjusted trouble. We worked some on his lower neck, worked some on the middle of his back, and, and worked on his SI joints or sacroiliac joints back here in the back end. So, so we're going to start out, let's have him walk away from us again here. And we'll notice that that left side is starting to come up a little bit more. The right side isn't coming as high and it's starting to go down below neutral again. Okay. Then as we bring him back here, we'll go ahead and have her stop here in the middle and turn him sideways for us. We'll go set ahead and see if he has any spring in his back or if we got some bounce. Kind of need to move it. Let's try to square him up with the camera a little bit. There we go. All right. So as we bounce him, you can see he's got a nice spring to his back all the way along. He bounces all the way. We come to this problem spot that wasn't bouncing before, and you can see that he's got some really good spring there. Okay. Then come back to the next stretches. Remember that at the very beginning, 
Trouble had some problems coming over here and eating off his right shoulder. He'd follow the treat almost all the way around and then we'd lose it. Now he's coming over here, he's eating right here and I can see his eye. So just those few minor adjustments that we made on him has allowed him to move better. Hopefully that will allow him to perform at his best the next time he's asked to, to run a pattern. Remember, if you see any of these problems in your horse, either contact myself or a professional animal chiropractor certified by the AVCA in your area. Thank you. Up next on HorseCity.com TV, we'll wrap up our show with a look at Karen Scholl's bubble of comfort. That's in the irons. Now we're going in the irons with Karen Scholl. Hi, I'm Karen Scholl with Horsemanship for Women. What I'd like to demonstrate today to you is a concept that I call the bubble of comfort. Horses are motivated by comfort. So when we apply pressure, either steady pressure or rhythmic pressure, the only reason we're doing this is so that the horse can seek what's comfortable. So right now, this horse is standing here, this clip is hanging straight up and down, he's in a zone of comfort, okay? If I want him to back up, he's a little bit in my space, I'm gonna add a little bit of rhythmic pressure and ask him just to not move his nose, but just move his nose backwards. When he moves backwards, I'm going to give him back, put him back into his bubble of comfort. So when we ride the horse or move the halter, anything that we ask a horse to do is highly motivated if we give them a bubble of comfort when they're giving us the response that we're looking for. If we get into the habit of hanging on to the clip, hanging on to the horse's head, always hanging on and keeping pressure on, you know what that would feel like to you. You'd start tossing your head and getting that person to get their hand off your face. Okay? So what I want to make sure horses understand is that when they're doing the right thing, I'm going to do their favorite thing, which is leave them alone. So I'm going to show this to you and how this applies to riding as well. So when I first got on this horse, when he felt weight on his back, he got bothered. You see his ears are back, he got a little bit concerned. So what I did is I just held him until he relaxed and then I put him back into his bubble of comfort. So what the horse starts to understand is that when he's doing the right thing, I'm going to take the pressure off. This is the great motivator for horses. It's not our leg or our rein or the pressure on the bit that motivates a horse, it's the release that follows. So if I can describe this bubble of comfort looking something like this. imagine that if I had a hula hoop that replaced my reins and I had another hula hoop around his girth area that replaced my legs. If I were going to take those two hula hoops and I'm going to move that bubble of comfort over this way, see I've closed my left leg, opened my right, and see he's moved back into the center of that bubble. Same thing the other way. If I take those two hula hoops and direct them back this way, See, he's going to move back into the center. He's going to seek that comfort. But if I keep pressure on a horse all the time, all the time, all the time, then they start having resistance. They start pushing into pressure. They start throwing their head. They start rooting on the bit. You know, and we have to do things like put tie downs and, and tie their nose shut, where if I can just give the horse comfort, why would he gape his mouth? So how this applies, even when I go to ride, is that if I ask him to tip, tip his nose back, say I want him to back up. See, I'm moving his bubble of comfort backwards, okay, and he's got a little bit of resistance there, so I'm going to wait until he finds the release. See, he moved back into that bubble of comfort. Then I can build on that. So, ladies, you know that feeling of the best dance partner you ever had. And if you have to sit next to your honey on the couch and go, yes, honey, it was you. Okay. Every woman remembers the best dance partner. And what I want this horse to think the next time he sees me is go, oh, boy, here comes Karen. I want to dance with her again. So do you see him finding his comfort right here? Okay. So when, same thing. If I ask him to go forwards, I'm going to take away that bubble of comfort, give it back to him when he goes forwards. Take away that bubble of comfort, bring it back, 
give it back to him when he goes backwards. So this is the concept that I want to share with you and if you can apply this to your horse it's a great motivator to get your horse to be both respectful and highly motivated seeking the comfort not the pressure that comes on but the comfort that follows. Stay tuned to learn more about today's show. That's all the time we have for today. Don't forget to go online and enter for your chance to win a free laptop. We're giving away one every month, so be sure and register every time. If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch it all online. We'll see you next time. Until then, be sure to go to HorseCity.com where you can find the latest news in the horse world, see horses for sale, and so much more. HorseCity.com is keeping the horse world connected.